Hello, everyone. From Mastering MuseScore, I'd like to welcome you to the MuseScore Cafe. So this is uh, June 29th, 2022, and um, this is my regular series of uh, chats where we talk about some aspect of making music using MuseScore. I encourage people as you're showing up to just check in in the chat. Let me know where you're coming from. Let me know if you can see and hear everything okay, because, you know, computers stuff happens. Um, so I'm uh, always uh, interested to, to find out where people are from also. and. Um, so today's episode is, uh, I'm gonna be talking about instruments. So I'm just gonna talk about the different musical instruments that exist in the world that MuseScore can kind of let you notate for, not go into a ton of detail on any one of them, um, but uh, talk, about, talk about them in general. So give me a moment here while I set something up that I realize I need to set up differently. And uh, just uh, pay no attention to what I'm doing here. I'm cutting in and out on audio, really. Cutting in and out on audio. So that, that shouldn't be the case. Um, so let me think about this. I wasn't screen sharing. That's the issue, right? So the music wasn't happening, right? You weren't, uh, you weren't even seeing, you know, weren't even seeing what I wanted you to be seeing, which is, of course, my screen. So um, let me just do another quick little, uh, quick little thing of that, and give me a second here. Da, 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 da. Um, I need to get this all sized. All right, here we go. This is what I meant to do. Music now? Music now? Yes? No? Um, so, sorry, I'm um, still, every time I change something up, I have to like get something in my head about how I need to do things, but supposedly that should be doing it. Um, and so my goal here is to have the chat up all the time on the right, like this so that when we when I post the video later the chat is right there in the video and so I that's something new that, that I set up yesterday and in setting that up uh, obviously uh, forgot to do something that I should have been doing so um, so at this point I would like to think that you're uh, you're seeing right um, that you're seeing the music and hearing it so, uh, because if you can't see and hear the music, talking about instruments is gonna be tough. So I'd love to get some confirmation of that. Meanwhile, I'm gonna get started, okay? Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to first show you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a new score and we're gonna talk about the instruments that you can create. So first of all, this, what we're looking at, as you know, this is the default score you normally see when you start MuseScore. And um, some people, like I start with this score all the time if I'm just playing around. Um, but if I'm really creating a score, I create a score, right? So I actually go file new, or uh, I um, hit this icon here to create a new score, or I use the shortcut control N. Right, so um, everything black and no sound. Seriously, yeah. Um, then, then this maybe Denny, maybe you should uh, refresh your browser because um, I guess some people had that issue before. Um, yep, always something, always something with with the, this kind of stuff. Um, but I'm glad it's working at least for some some people, and I'd love to hear from anyone else who's present if uh, if things look uh, look normal. But when I look at things myself, things seem fine. So I'm still hearing comments about sound issues. So let me um let me try something here. Yeah. I 
Yeah, I, I think I think refresh your screen, and if that doesn't work, leave and come back. As far as the sound goes, I'd like to think that this all works okay, but I'm I'm gonna just do something that I, I shouldn't need to do, but I'm gonna do anyhow. Um, and maybe this will fix sound for some people. If it makes it worse, let me know. Um, <laughs> no, don't everyone move to Denver? Um, you know, people. Yeah, you're you're welcome here. It's just. Uh, you know, we have we have we have lots of people. Um, okay, so I'm going to create a new score here, and and when we do this, one thing that you'll see is that all there's tempo, uh, all these um, templates here, and these are really useful. I think in general, maybe the templates get underused. I think maybe, um, but like under the choral template, there's ones already set up for SATB, SATB with organ, with piano, close score, barbershop, all these things that are already set up. Glad things are working, Denny. And um, here's, you know, uh, chamber music. We got string quartets, wind quintets, etc. Um, we have solo guitar, solo guitar with tablature and piano. We have jazz lead sheets, right? We have all these different templates, rock band, bluegrass band, um, concert band, brass band, battery percussion, pit percussion, etc. cetera. Um, and then, oh yeah, orchestral ones, uh, the classical orchestra, symphony, string orchestra, different, all these different templates that are already set up with all these different instruments. Um, so these are often a great starting point, and then you can add and remove instruments from them. Um, so uh, I definitely um, uh, recommend using these templates if they're even close to what you want. Like if I'm going to write for a jazz combo, uh, I might pick the jazz combo template and then make my score for it. And then notice, okay, trumpet, alto sax, tenor sax, trombone, guitar, piano, bass, drums. That's what it's there by default. And, you know, maybe I don't have both an alto and a tenor sax. Or maybe I've got two altos and no trombone. Well, I can go add and remove instruments, right? Um, so, uh, and to do that, it's edit instruments which has the shortcut I. And this brings us to a dialogue, which is what we would have seen if we hadn't used the template. It's a, a, a dialogue where it lets us choose instruments. So I'm going to go back to creating a score. And um, so, yeah, at this point, uh, if I wanted to remove the tenor, I click the tenor, remove from score. If I want to add an alto sax, I go to woodwinds and alto sax, add to score. And now I got two altos and no tenor. And so I can make all these sorts of changes to things from here, right? So edit instruments is how you can add and remove instruments from your score. But if I go back to now create a new score, again, um, uh, when I do this, I was looking at the templates. But if I had instead looked at choose instruments, it's going to pop up a dialogue that looks pretty much exactly like that edit instruments dialogue, right? And so in here is where you get to choose the instruments you want to use in your score. And I want to point out a few things about this dialogue before we look at the actual instruments in it. One is this score ordering up at the top here. This was added at MuseScore 3.6, so it's been here for about a year and a half now. And you'll see if you drop down here, there's orchestral, there's choir, marching band, big band, combo. These uh, have to do with the order the instruments appear in. In other words, for instance, uh, in an orchestral score, where do winds appear relative to voices? And does that change if it's a rock band? And yes, it does, because you probably want the voices at top on a rock band, but you want them below the winds in uh, an orchestral score. So there's a lot of different things that are different. Or piano versus drums. In an orchestral score, percussion goes above piano. In jazz and pop scores, percussion goes below piano. And uh, so all sorts of things like that can be different depending on genre. So you shouldn't have to be fiddling with that individually. If you pick the right score ordering, MuseScore can do that for you. So that's something to know. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it set at orchestral. 
uh, orchestral um, ordering. So as I add instruments to my score, they're going to get the orchestral ordering. And I can still um, still move things around. So Marla, glad that your uh, sound and chat is working. And I'm curious, because I know you were having trouble before. Did it turn out to be switching to a different browser is what did the trick or what? I mean, I'm still learning about, uh, you know, what works and what doesn't work and uh, um, still learning. Um, but yeah, I'm glad to see uh, people are mostly getting things, are, are mostly happy here. So, um, what else, what else am I uh, doing here? Um, okay, and you don't know Myla, <laughs> that's okay. Um, um, so, by the way, uh, I, I mentioned before, and I'm going to mention this again just because I'll, I'll be curious to see any feedback. I am, I have made some modifications to my screen setup here so that the chat is always visible here within the video. What that means is for you, you're seeing it as part of my screen share and you're seeing the actual chat that you can type into. I recognize that's probably a little disorienting. Um, I'm hoping it's not too disorienting. The advantage is I can always see the chat and when the recording is finished and I upload that, the chat's going to be visible right there within the recording so you can always match the chat with the video. And I'll post the chat as comment also. But I'm thinking this is a general improvement to the experience, but you all let me know. Let me know if it feels distracting during it, and then if afterwards it's like, oh, it was worth it. These are the kind of things that I, I, I want to know about. All right. So um, let's take a look now at the instruments themselves, because this is really what I want to focus on here. By default, and I mentioned this in the newsletter, only the common instruments show up here. Um, uh, so the common instruments are uh, um, what we, you know, the people who are designing this dialogue decided should be common. And realistically, it's changed over the years. People have said, oh, I think this should be added. I think this should be removed, blah, blah, blah. So it, it, it sort of settled. It sort of morphed into what it is right now in this common list. And so if I open up winds, woodwinds, I see a list of what? Five saxophones, a couple of clarinets, oboe, bassoon, piccolo, flute, and recorder, right? That is what I see. Well, these are the common wind instruments. Okay, glad to see all the good comments about liking the chat in the video. Great, it's a keeper then. Um, cool. Um, of course, the chat is still there off to the side, and you're all obviously finding it to be able to uh, type into it. Um, I have to <laughs> watch myself because I'm going to want to type into this thing, and I can't. It's just it's just there for show. Um, but anyhow, um, uh, um, what am I saying? Uh, I keep losing my train of thought because, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be. Um, these are not all the woodwinds there are. If this is the ones that, these are the ones you're likely to encounter in a jazz setting, in a concert band setting, or in a um, in an orchestral setting. These are the most common woodwind instruments. But there's any number of woodwind instruments that just aren't, that just didn't make the cut. So if I switch from common to, well, first of all, notice that I can switch to specific things. I can, I can switch to marching band. And under marching band, I see a couple of those went away, actually. Recorder went away. Uh, that might be the only one that went away. Oh, oboe. Oboe went? Yeah, oh, oboe and bassoon went away because we don't use oboe and bassoon in marching band. Why? Because double reeds are terrible to march with. You would most likely destroy your reed, and those reeds are expensive expensive and take a lot of work. Most most uh, oboe players and bassoon players end up making their own, um, which is a whole world in itself. But yeah, marching with them, that's like a, a, a no-go. You don't, you don't do that. So uh, the marching band one actually has fewer um, wind instruments. If I switch to concert band, I grow some new ones because now uh, English horn is in the list. Alto flute is in the list. E flat clarinet, alto clarinet, contrabass clarinet. I played contrabass clarinet in concert band in, in, in middle school and yeah, that thing was twice as tall as I was. Uh, maybe not twice as tall, but, but taller. Um, so we've got all these additional instruments that are used in a woodwind instruments used in a concert band setting. Um, and then similarly, 
the other instruments also you know the, if i opened up brass we would see a lot more brass instruments here than might be in the common instruments but if i go to all instruments i'm going to get more still now you see sub contra alto flute the dizzy or ditzy i don't even know how you say that flageolet the flageolet i don't even know what this is irish flute a variety of gems horns in different keys ocarina i know what that one is that's kind of cool it's like a, a hollowed out gourd that you play yeah uh flute like um pan flutes all these different variations on recorders right i mean so when you put on all instruments you get a ton of instruments a ton and now I almost never do that because it's overwhelming if I'm looking for an ocarina I just type ocarina into the into the search box and it shows me all my ocarinas so that's great I don't have to hunt through a big long listing to find it right I just type into this list so I'm gonna close I'm gonna clear out that search box and I'm going to look at these instrument families here. We have woodwinds, free reed, brass, pitched percussion, unpitched percussion, marching percussion, body percussion, vocals, keyboards, electronic, strings plucked, and strings bowed. Ah, okay, a ditzy is a strange Chinese flute. Is it ditzy, like with a T, kind of like a German Z, or is it dizzy, like a, in a, an English Z sound? I'm just kind of curious. Um, uh, so these categories, a couple of these don't exist under common instruments. Like I think the marching and body percussions are going to go away if I switch to common instruments. Um, oh, body percussion stayed, but uh, marching percussion went away and electronic instruments uh, went away. So I'm going to stick with the common list here because, you know, I don't want to take an entire day just looking at instruments. And I'm not going to look at every single instrument, but I want to talk about each instrument family and talk about what's involved, what defines that family, and what you need to know writing for it. So in the woodwinds, the first few instruments listed here. Now, by the way, these instruments are listed within the woodwinds family by subfamilies. So um, piccolo, flute, and recorder are similar in a way that oboe well actually they're not entirely listed because oboe and bassoon are similar but the clarinets are listed between them why because that's the order they're typically in in, a, in an orchestral score the saxophones are all together here because that's how they're usually listed so i want to talk about each of these families the the piccolo flute and recorder family i don't know if there's a specific um name, but these are the reedless woodwinds. Most of the woodwind instruments have reeds. So it's a, a piece of wood that vibrates, or plastic or metal, depending on your, your preference. Um, uh, so um, most would, most, I don't know, many woodwind instruments, clarinets and saxophones and oboes and bassoons and related instruments, get their sound by vibrating a reed and so they have a mouthpiece they have a reed and that's basically all the instruments from oboe on down to, to baritone saxophone the top three make their sound without a reed right um there's differences the piccolo and the flute are cross transverse instruments recorder is in front of you that you blow into and differences also in terms of the what's going on with the embouchure how you make the sound so flutes and recorders are different in that way but i want to talk about what the fact that these instruments have reeds and these don't does not have a huge effect on how you want to write for them. I'm going to put in a flute and I'm going to put in a clarinet in my score. And, um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about them. But just so we have a reed instrument and a nod reed instrument. But with wind instruments in general, woodwind instruments in general, I'm going to... Um, uh, uh, focus a little more on the picture of me now than on, on MuseScore, and if it's too small, let me know. I could kill my screen share if I needed to, but I, 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 you know, I think if you view full screen, you'll be able to see what you need to here. Woodwind instruments generally use your fingers to play a scale like C, D, E, F, G, A, B, 
C. Some variation of that. All your fingers down is a C, all your fingers up is a high C, low C, high C, and to play a C major scale, you lift your fingers one at a time. Or to play it descending, you put your fingers down one at a time. And yeah, side keys, all sorts of other stuff going on on top of that. But woodwind instruments are designed in such a way that playing scales on them is quite easy. You just lift your fingers one at a time. And also, if you want to play a, a leap, uh, like leap up from C to G, it means lifting several fingers at once. It's not terribly hard. A little harder than lifting one finger to maybe lift several fingers, especially if you're lifting fingers across both hands, but it's not particularly difficult. And you don't have to do anything different with your lips as you do this. So you can write relatively freely for wind instruments with one caveat. The caveat is you lift your fingers one at a time to get to a C. That only gives you one octave. How do you get to the next octave? Well, you're going to Put all your fingers back down, and then you're going to press something with your thumb, or you're going to change something about your embouchure or both. And when you do that, everything goes up an octave higher. Clarinet doesn't go up an octave, it goes up a twelfth. Why did they invent that? I do not know. I, I don't know what they were thinking. Probably some good logical reason. Maybe it was so you could play in two different keys easily. I, I don't even know what the heck anyone was thinking. But in any case, on clarinet, this key that for everyone else is called an octave is called the register key and it and this doesn't bring you up an octave it brings you up a twelfth which is an octave plus a fifth so this is actually low F but with the register key it's high C and then you then you put so this is an F scale and then with the register key it's a C scale but an octave and a fifth higher so what this means is woodwind instruments all have a break Right? Um, and yeah, I am actually familiar with um, some Chinese flutes, some Japanese flutes, some Native American flutes, some different types of flutes from different cultures, um, but that one was not one that I knew. Um, so, uh, but yeah, almost all woodwind instruments have those same qualities. They can play really well within an octave either the lower octave or the higher octave. And then you can usually get a third octave too by playing more tricks, but then it's trickier from there. Um, clarinets, again, have a longer range because that second octave is, is a twelfth higher, and so you use side keys and stuff because you wonder, well, what happens when I run out of fingers? Well, then you start playing these, you, you press these other keys, and you get these really bad-sounding notes. Not bad-sounding, but not as, not as good as the rest of the instrument. Um, to kind of cover the space until you can put all your fingers back down when it starts to sound good again. Um, and yeah, I, I don't mean to say good and bad, but it's just a different sound quality. Um, so uh, when you're writing for woodwinds, you do want to be a little careful that you might have a note that's like a B here and then C, the next higher note there, B, C requires putting all your fingers down. It's only two notes apart. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and just create the score right now. And I'm going to go to concert pit because I don't want to talk about transposition right now. But if I um actually I guess I I'm not going to go to it because I need to know what instruments what notes I'm really talking about. If I want to go from um an A, which is the highest note now B flat is, but I'm going to play with A. This A here is a note that it's got like all your fingers off and you play one key here that opens up uh, opens up a hole and then this B you gotta put all your fingers back down A to B is putting all your fingers down even though they're only step away a step apart right so there are some steps on any woodwind instrument that are harder to play than any other and you need to know where they are it's usually between B and C, uh, but it doesn't have to be because of the design of the instrument. And then often there's like, you know, if, if you have to trill between those two notes, um, if you have to trill between those two notes, there is a special way you can play B using a whole bunch of side keys. It doesn't, it's not as well as in tune, doesn't sound as good, but it does at least let you make that trill happen um, so that you can quickly go back and forth between the A and B without driving yourself too crazy. Um, by the way, I just want to take a look and make sure my uh, 
yeah, that looks okay. I just wanted to see my uh, <laughs> see my picture for a second there. So all woodwind instruments have a break that you want to be aware of when writing across, and it does also mean the sound quality will change, especially on internet has the most noticeable sound quality change across that break. Mm, you could argue that it's a subjective thing, but the sound quality. Yeah, I don't hear the difference here in the samples because I think, you know, it's synthesized. That's probably not a real B it's, or probably not a real A. It was probably a B that was then uh, sampled down or something. I don't really know. Um, actually, let me hear this. I can kind of hear kind of hear a little bit of a difference in sound quality there, but it, it's, it tends to be a bit more extreme. And I, actually, I want to bring the volume level uh, back up because I turned it down for the theme music. Anyhow, take my word for it. A real instrument, there's a more noticeable difference. I do have a clarinet sitting over there, but it's not in good shape, and I won't be able to make that B sound the way it should sound. So woodwind instruments, really good at playing scalar-type figures, and, and C. In particular, the C major scale in their key is the easy one to play. Um, for clarinet, it, it's F and C that are both easy um, because of that transposition. Um, yeah, so pitch, yeah, absolutely. The, so, the notes at the extremes of these uh, things can be a little off in pitch. And also, what I'm about to get to here is the, the notes of that C scale, whatever, like a flute, C scale is C. On a clarinet, you might play a C, a C scale, but what comes out sounds like B flat. That's because that's why we call it a B flat clarinet because its C sounds like B flat. All the anytime you see a name, a, a key name in a in an instrument name like a B flat clarinet or an F horn or an E flat alto saxophone, that tells you that the notated C on that instrument sounds like that other instrument for historic reasons that allow you to play different size instruments with the same fingering. It's all complicated. That's a whole other thing. But I've talked about transposition before. Um, but yeah, the C scale uh, as written for that instrument is always the easy one to play. And it's also the one that's the most perfectly in tune. All other scales are going to require use using little side keys or in between keys or fingerings that like skip a finger and then put down other fingers like on recorder and those are never as in tune so yeah there's always going to be some notes on woodwind instruments that are not as in tune as others and of course we could also then talk about well what does it mean to be in tune right pianos are typically tuned to be equal temperament meaning all half steps are exactly the same as i'm about to see when i talk about brass because i spent way too long on woodwinds um we talk about brass, we're going to learn that brass instruments can't be tuned to equal temperament. It's not going to work that way. So, yeah, there's going to be intonation issues. The further you get from the home key for that instrument, the more out of tune it is. So B-flat clarinet sounds great in B-flat. It's written C, sounding B-flat. An, an A scale on a B-flat clarinet does not sound, or a, playing, playing a, a sharp key on on B flat clarinet will be a little more out of tune and that's why there are also A clarinets that they are tuned to be perfectly in tune in A and uh, it's almost the same size as a B flat clarinet so it's not a difference in range it's just a difference in key it'll make sharp keys easier to play and more in tune so B flat clarinet makes flat keys easier to play and more tune in more in tune a clarinet makes sharp keys easier to play and more in tune now you may notice that when we went to the instruments dialog only the b flat clarinet showed up here but if i type clarinet into the search box you'll see that there's c clarinets d clarinets e flat g b flat a i'm here to tell you these are not all equally common um the uh yeah and harps of course um you got to tune it all the time and but the thing is you tune a clarinet every time too but you're only tuning one you, you tune the whole instrument at once you can't individually tune each string like you can on a harp or each note so you just have to accept that one key is going to be perfectly in tune and the others are not and that's just the way it is so um for clarinet 
B flat clarinet is the standard clarinet that most people have. Whether you play clarinet because you pl played it in junior high school band or whether you're playing in a uh, you know a traditional jazz band or you're playing in a concert band or you're playing in an orchestra you're going to play a B flat clarinet mostly a lot or a klezmer band. However, if you're playing in an orchestra, you probably also own an A clarinet because a lot of orchestral music is written in sharp keys because, as we're going to see, stringed instruments <laughs> tend to do better with sharp keys than they do with flat keys. So um, uh, the A clarinet, orchestral players will generally own both instruments, both a B-flat clarinet and an A clarinet. Most other musicians won't. Most other clarinet players will just own the B-flat. Uh, Colleen, I know you play clarinet. I don't suppose you. I know you collect instruments too. I don't know if you uh, if you own an A clarinet or not. I've never owned one, never played one, but I have played an E flat clarinet, which is a smaller one. And this you don't use because it's a different key. Use just because it can play higher. And the alto clarinet is at an E flat alto is bigger and plays lower. So. Um, Anyhow, those are the clarinets. I want to go, I want to move on now back to common instruments and talk a little bit about brass. I'm going to skip free reed, harmonica, and accordion. I'll sometime talk about harmonica and accordion separately, but I want to focus on on the big, uh, important orchestral uh, slash concert band type instruments that we might normally be writing for. The common ones here are horns, cornets, trumpets trombones, and tubas. And so I'm going to add a horn, a trumpet, a trombone, and a tuba to my score. I'm going to skip the cornet. And I'll tell you why I'm going to... Oh, by the way, and the same thing here. If I type trumpet, you're going to see that there's not just B-flat trumpets. There's C trumpets, D trumpets, A trumpets, etc. In this case, orchestral players also, everyone who plays trumpet generally plays B-flat trumpet. But orchestral players will also have a C trumpet because C trumpet is used a lot. Why not A trumpet? I don't know. It's, uh, there is an A trumpet, but it's nowhere near as commonly used. You're expected as an orchestral player to have a C trumpet, um, but you're not necessarily expected to have an A trumpet unless you're an instrument collector. And this is, when I say expected, it's because uh, you know, the music has to be transposed for these instruments. If you actually are playing in an orchestra, you might be handed a part written for B-flat trumpet or written for C trumpet. You have to have that trumpet. If it was written for B-flat trumpet, you have to have a B-flat trumpet to play it, or else you have to transpose everything yourself. If you try to play a B-flat trumpet part on C trumpet, you're going to have to transpose everything, or vice versa, if you've got a B-flat trumpet and you're given a C part. You're going to have to transpose everything as you play it. So, um, and yeah, some people might do that occasionally, but you generally don't want to. Um, and there's still the t tuning issue to deal with that. The, you know, the B-flat trumpet is going to be more in tune in B-flat than it is in, in a sharp key. So, let me add these instruments to my score, and I'll talk a little bit about what happens on, on brass instruments. I mentioned that woodwind instruments have this scale thing going on where you just lift your fingers one at a time to play a scale. Brass instruments typically, like most of them, have valves, right? The trombone is the exception in that it's got a slides. I'll uh, come back to that. And yeah, I think you'll find that most uh, brass parts actually, C trumpet was, was probably more common than B flat until the 1800s. I'm just making that up, but I think it's true. I think it was really the rise of, you know, kind of military bands and stuff like that where the B flat instruments became the absolute most common. Uh, before that, you would see a lot more variation. Um, but yeah, classical music in general, you're going to see a ton of C trumpets because, yeah, orchestral players are expected to use them. Um, okay, so brass, you can't play a whole scale like that. You only have three valves, right? So there's a thing, and, I, and I, if there's any brass players here, feel free to um, uh, um, kind of correct me or help me out with this, but I'm actually not going to talk about the valves. I'm going to talk about a trombone first, a trombone that doesn't have valves. There is such thing as a valve trombone, but I'm going to talk about the slide trombone. Uh, Heiss, if you're here, um, you know, I know you know brass and you know trombone. Trombones, you you blow into, but you got this slide here for the pitch. 
And I mentioned that on woodwind instruments, you lift your fingers and that gives you an octave, and then you do something that might involve your embouchure to switch up to the next octave. Well, that embouchure thing is like it's a subtle thing with woodwind instruments that usually there's a key and maybe a subtle embouchure thing that you do to switch octaves. On brass instruments, the embouchure is king. It is the only way to switch from one set of notes to the next set of notes. There are seven notes. There are seven notes you can play. So, um, what, what do I mean by this? On a trombone, low, I'm, I'm going to like simplify everything. Uh, trombones don't actually transpose, but they are typically tuned to B flat. So what we would say is this is a B flat with your, home, with your uh, slide all the way in. Is that a B flat? Hmm. Here's my B flat. Okay, mom. So, Here's a B flat, and now if I move out a little bit, it's an A. A little bit more, it's a G. A little bit more, it's a G flat. A little bit more, it's an F. A little bit more, it's an E. And now my arm is out as far as it goes. That's what happens on a trombone. There are seven positions they're called. Seven positions. So this guy, I'm going to write in these with fingering. That's called first position, second position, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh position. Seven positions on a trombone, all the way up to all the way down. And you might think, well, how do you know where fourth position is? You, 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 you just know. It's, it's very much like playing a violin. How do you know where to put your finger on that string? There's no frets, right? You just learn it through practice. You get used to where that spot is. And then you listen and you tune it as you go. Oh, this was a little flat. I guess I pushed, I put my arm out a little too far. I'll pull it in a little bit. To me, it's amazing that you can do that. But it's, I guess, not more amazing than you can sing in tune, right? I mean, there's no magic button on your voice to make it do that. But I actually sang that pretty well in tune. B flat A, A flat G, G flat F, E, B flat E. Right? I, 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 got, I got that chromatic scale pretty well in tune in my voice. Um, and so, yeah, you can learn to get that in your hand as well, in your arms as well. Now, these seven positions, then, that allows you to play uh, that B flat and then down. Now, the next thing, though, is that is with my, mm, my lip at a certain uh, position, a certain embouchure, tightness of embouchure. If I then uh, um, loosen my embouchure one notch, um, yeah, well, trombone is do tune the instrument. Yeah, because there is a pitch slide. Because you want that first position to be perfectly in tune. So you tune it to get first position in tune. Um, but then, after that, you're, you're adjust. Just like on a, a violin, you tune to get the open strings in tune, and then you, you know, do everything else by ear. But So a trombone, you get first position in tune, uh, using the tuning slider, and then everything else is with this. And I oversimplify a little bit, but, um, you know, to a rough approximation, this is how you do it. If I then loosen my embouchure one notch on the trombone, I'm going to get an F. If I loosen it another notch, I'm going to get a low flat. If I loosen it up another notch, I get this B flat here, which is called a, actually, is this true? Now I might be lying. That's the pedal B flat that you can't actually play, but you wish you could. Um, now I'm not so sure. You might have to help me out with the overtone series aspect of this. But the idea is that this is the overtone series. Low B flat, low, you know, super low B flat, and then normal low B flat, and then F in the middle. F in the middle of the staff, higher B flat, and then the next thing in the overtone series would be D up here, and then F up here, right? Every time you tighten up your embouchure, you get the next higher thing in the overtone series. This low B flat here, if I'm right about what this is, this would be the, what's called the fundamental tone. Um, ah, tune for position, not against the nut. That makes sense. So you have a little wiggle room. Totally makes sense. Good to know. Um, uh, 
and you have a little wiggle room and you don't bang up against it every time you play that note and you can adjust if the band starts to move a little sharp and all so uh um i i could totally see a lot of reasons why you might do that so if i'm if i'm thinking about this right this is the fundamental tone of the overtone series that generally speaking you can't actually play you you kind of sort of can maybe on some trombones and if you're skilled at it and but generally you don't expect to be able to play that instead the lowest note you expect to be able to play is the low e you would get actually let me move this over a measure the low e that you would get by by basically taking this whole series down an octave this is the low note on a trombone it's that b flat in seventh position. The low B flat in seventh position to play that E. Um, that's the lowest note that you can reasonably play on a trombone unless you're capable. Now some trombones have triggers and other things that and there's bass trombones or trombones that allow you to get to move everything down a fifth basically or down a fourth I think it is. Um, so there's all sorts of special considerations for trombone and I don't want to over focus on trombone but I want to mention that on trombone moving from seventh position to first position <laughs> this is a lot of motion. Right? So, the thing is, you look at this F here, and you look at this F and say, oh, well, this F is also in first position, um, uh, because this is what I get by just playing in first position and loosening my embouchure a little bit. However, I can also then get a chromatic scale going down from here. So this is also um, all the different positions here. And I'll put an explicit natural sign on this. Remind me that it's really a, a, a natural. Um, what you'll see here is that you can play this E two different ways. It could either be me flat in seventh position, or it could be F in second position, right? So, um, uh, trombones will still trombones aren't going to change their basic tuning just because of the key. Oh, and yeah, that sucks. Um, so uh, it sucks that everyone has to tune to the A because it's not a good note for some people to tune to. But it's only tuning second position, right? So my guess is that the, in at least some contexts, you'll get two tuning notes. You'll get an A for the strings, and then the woodwind players will kind of, or the wind players will look at each other and say, Let, let's tune our B flats too. That's what happens in my world a lot. Um, whether it happens in professional orchestras, I can't say. But in situations I've worked in where you have mixed winds and strings, yeah, we, we generally uh, uh, work, on, we work on them both separately. But that's a really good question. So what you'll see is there's two different ways of playing that E. You can either play that E way down here, B, B flat in seventh position, or F in second position. It's the same E, but this one's going to be generally easier to play. So if I have to play between E and F, I can do that. I can do that by just, um, you know, E, F, E, D, 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 D. Um, but if I also need to go up to the G flat here, between F and G flat, I might prefer to play G flat at G flat F, G flat F, G flat F in fifth and sixth position because they're right next door. That might be smarter than playing first position first position and then fifth position for the G flat. It might be smarter to use these two. I don't know. I'm not a trombone player, but I imagine that you have to second guess this. Kind of like how on guitar you might know that, hey, I can play a G at, at the 12th fret of this string or the 9th fret of that string or I'm just making up numbers and you have to figure out, well, which one is going to be smarter, right? So on trombone, there's probably some amount of that that happens. But my point is that this, there are these same seven positions uh, that are just dependent on where you start your embouchure and then uh, where you move your arm from there. Valved instruments work the same way. I went most of my life not knowing this. I didn't understand this at all. I, I thought trombones and trumpets were totally different. Now I realize they are really the same thing. On trumpet, 
you've got three valves open. All three of them open is basically first position. So you'll get a B flat, a B flat concert, which will be notated as a C. Um, if you just blow in your mouthpiece, you're going to get a B flat. If you blow with the appropriate embouchure, anyhow, and open. Then, as you start pressing valves, what? And I'm I'm actually describing this backwards, so forgive me. Um, but uh, in principle. Every combination of valves is like you're lengthening the pipe by that much. The reality is, I think, uh, it's designed so that you're shortening the pipe. I'm, I have to, I, yeah, I have to think about how that actually works. Someone else could maybe tell me. But in principle, you got seven positions here. You got seven valve positions with three valves. If you think about binary, <laughs> binary uh, math here, you got three valves. You can make eight different combinations there. Well, one of them happens to not to be useful, and the other seven are. So there's open. There's first valve down only. There's first and second down only. There's second and third only. There's first and third. Um, so what did I just say? So I got open. I got first valve. Oh, first valve only. So open, first valve only, second valve only, third valve only, which doesn't really happen. Um, and there's actually going to be more than that. So yeah, there's several that are useless, I think. Um, third valve only. Um, open, first valve, second valve, third valve. And then you got first and second, first and third, second and third, and all three. Yeah, I think it's going to be eight. Um, and basically, some of those the, those different patterns correspond to these seven positions in some way that someone who is a brass player would have to explain better. Jim, I, I know you're a woodwind player, but you taught band, so you probably know or not, because maybe you never had to think about it at that level either. Um, so in any case, you basically have the same seven positions on trumpet that you do on trombone. They're just achieved using different combinations of your three valves. So what it means is that you can play these same seven notes, but up an octave. Um, you can play these same seven notes. Uh, let me select that range. And I am going to go to concert pitch now. These same seven notes up an octave. So second valve is half step down. First valve is one step down. Okay, so it is going down. So that's good to know. Oh, and then others are, yeah, so that, that's, that's good to know. So um, second valve is a half step down. First valve is one step down. So that, that's basically corresponding to second and third positions. Um, the others might be uh, fourth, fifth, sixth position at the next uh, embouchure thing, the next partial, but I... I just don't play these instruments enough to know. But because I, I, it's not important to know the details of this. What's important is to understand the principle, which is that on trumpet, you can play within a range of basically a, a tritone, a fifth, you know, just short of a perfect fifth, a little more than a fourth. Um, that is much you can play and... Uh, Perfect, Jim. Thanks for thanks for filling these in there. So one and two, because I, I know I know how to play a scale, <laughs> but I have to do the math to think about what that's telling me in terms of uh, um, in terms of the positions. I, I also remember infamously uh, of uh, a cool cigarette commercial from the uh, '70s or '80s. Not a commercial, a print ad that showed this trumpet player with his third valve down playing a note, and all the trumpet players laughing their heads off because that's the one that doesn't get used. And they're like, you never use third valve by itself that's not a thing other than for trills but then it wouldn't be this like that you wouldn't have that you'd be seeing blur it was clearly he wasn't playing a trill it was just a model who didn't know how to play the trumpet um uh so um what what this means is there's a narrow range of notes remember on woodwind instrument it's a whole octave on brass instruments it's really only about a fourth that you play by moving these valves without changing your lips. So you can play any combination of these notes within that. And furthermore, chromatic changes, like on, on woodwind instruments, chromatic things require all these side keys. That's not as necessarily as big a consideration on trumpets because it's still just those same three valves. Although, depending on what key you're in, you 
you you might not need that for third valve a whole lot. You might be able to play just open first and second and not need the third valve much at all, depending on what key you're in. So, um, which is another reason why you know they're better tuned to their own home keys. Um, what it means is that you can write lines for trumpet within a narrow range if you know where the partials are and expect it to work. But anytime you have to leap from, say, this A to something above that B flat, now it involves a lip tightening. So going back and forth between even that A and the C right above it, unless there's some trick fingering, which there might be, but in general, moving between a note that is done in one partial versus a note that's done in the next partial. And partial is the term that we would use for the overtone series. What I really mean is tightening and loosening your lips. Having to move between notes from one partial to the next partial where you have to tighten or loosen your lips, it's a recipe for cracking notes. Right? So I'm not saying you can't ever leap between partials, but I am saying it's... um a bit trickier. It's, uh, it is trickier to play and you definitely have to be careful about how big a leap you write. Uh, leaping one partial is easier than leaping two partials. And how fast you ask someone to do it and whether you just go there and hold it or whether you're expecting to go just leaping back and forth. Because it might take you time to settle on that pitch. Do we, do we, right? It might be a little, do we, a little second before you settle on that pitch. And if you're just trying to go back and forth really quickly, you might never pull it off. Which is why things um, like uh, is, is like showing off on trumpet. Playing a chromatic thing is a, a famous concerto for trumpet, Harry James uh, in the jazz world, that um, uh, was basically a show off of his technique. And yeah, chromatic is, is not particularly difficult on trumpet, but it is easy to tie up your fingers. I mean, on a woodwind instrument, it's still basically lifting fingers one at a time and then working the side keys. On trumpet, it's a little more of a coordination exercise because you're lifting fingers and putting them down in, in semi-random feeling order. I, you practice it, you get used to it. Physically, it's not a lot of motion. I would say conceptually, it's harder than woodwind instruments. It, it requires more coordination in a way than a woodwind instrument, but it's not physically harder. Not physically harder. The way, for instance, on a harp, you can't play. And I did a whole session on harp, um, so I'm not going to uh, re revisit that right now. I'm going to move on to strings. But... Um, what I want to say about harp is remind you that on harp you can basically play a scale, right? You can play a C scale if you've got all your pedals in the neutral position. Or if you put them in the sharp position, you can play a C sharp scale, right? Or if you put most of them in the neutral position, put, put the F in the sharp position and the C in the sharp position, now you can play a D scale. You tune your harp with the pedals before playing a passage of music, and then you can play the scale that your harp is tuned to. And then you can retune from measure to measure, but you can't quickly retune every single note. It's just not practical. So you can't practically, physically, it is not practical to play a chromatic scale on the harp, at least not fast. So, but on woodwind or brass instruments, it's not at all difficult. And yeah, a flight of the bumblebee is. Notice how it's staying within a partial, though. It's all staying within a little narrowing. Move up a partial and then use the same fingerings. Now, if you played it in a key where that involved switching partials, now it's harder again. But. This is in keeping. Playing small passages of chromatic stuff can be very easy on trumpet. But a passage that involves playing fast but across that break of your partial is the next level a little harder. But if at least if it stays within only the one partial, you know, only having to change one partial, not having to change two, it's not as bad. But it is a difference to be aware that, that keeping it to a narrow range within a single partial um, makes it easier. So knowing where those partial breaks are, and basically knowing it's the B-flat overtone series, the low B-flat that you basically can't play on trumpet. So this low B-flat here, and then...
that low E here is the lowest note you can play on a trumpet, the E below the staff, that seventh position of that B flat. And it sounds really bad. <laughs> um, no, no offense to trumpet players, but it, it's um, not a good sounding note. Um, because uh, you're taking, yeah, you're, you're forcing the air all the way through the longest. It's like you're playing in seventh position on the trumpet and you're trying to, you're, you're, the buzz that you have over your lip doesn't really sustain the air that well. It is not, it, it's a useful sound. I don't, bad is subjective, whatever. It doesn't, it, it's not going to sound the way that E an octave higher does. Let's put it that way. Because this E an octave higher, just like on trombone, you can also play as this, um, F, I should have put this over here, and then put this here. So that E here, you can play in second position, which uh, if I'm looking at, uh, uh, that's half step down, so that's second valve, right? Second valve is that E. And do I, did I know that? Because I think I knew a C scale was C, D, E, no, that's first and second. Okay, anyhow, I, don't, I, 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 I should be quiet because I don't remember what's what. Oh, and this is concert, not, uh, this is concert pitch, not transpose pitch. That's why. So this is F sharp. That's right, second valve. I knew that. Um, um, so anyhow, um, knowing about the, the fact that switching registers on trumpet is, is, an, uh, not difficult like you can't do it, but difficult like it introduces problems and you have to be careful. It's one of the things you pay attention to in writing. Um, so fast feet and toe and heel to do it. So yeah, uh, I'm, I won't say it's impossible, but it's definitely physically uh, a much more of a juggling act than it is for pretty much a, any other instrument. Um, so the the pedal tones are these guys here. When I mentioned, so this isn't a pedal tone. Um, it would be lower notes than that. It's the ones that require you to actually lower your lips to the next partial down that are essentially not playable. This E is not a pedal tone. If you're capable of producing a buzz so low, I mean so loosely that you can actually get the fundamental, which is an octave below that, that's what's called a pedal tone. Um, so uh, um, the pedal tones are are basically that. They are the the fundamental pitches and the thing. At least that's my understanding. I, I I suppose someone else should can correct me if I'm wrong about that. But that's my understanding. Is that pedal tones refers to actually being able to play the fundamental, which is typically not really practical for most people on most instruments. Um, um, so yeah, you, you practice to overcome these limitations for sure, um, but they are kind of built into the instrument. All right, so I am going to move on and talk about strings. I did a whole session on strings once, so I knew it would be okay to not um, focus on them a whole lot here. I've also done a whole session on piano, a whole session on guitar, but I wanted to cover all the sort of other instruments here. Um, so where am I looking for? I'm looking for stringed instruments, um, bowed stringed instruments here. And yes, there's other ones in these, but here are our common ones, violins, violas, cellos, and basses. And here, what I want to tell you, did I not add a viola? I thought I added a viola. Violin, I guess I didn't add the viola. Notice how it just slots itself in right between the violin and cello because music score is smart. So the thing to know about violins is they are... All the stringed instruments are a little bit like trumpets in that you can only play in a, well, not that you can only play, you can play all the way up that string. You can play the low string, like the low string, a violin has four strings, right? A low, it's got um, uh, a G string down here, a D string, and so like if I try to play a note lower than that G, it colors it red. It can't play it, right? G is the lowest note you can play on that violin. And it's tuned in fifths. So the next note up is an A, and then the E, right? These are the five open strings. Now you can play that G, and then by moving your finger up the string, you can go up a full octave easily. So you can play that G up to here easily. And then you can go up beyond that another octave less easily. Um, 
this D, you can go up an octave easily, and then, you know, and depends on your skill level, because now you're playing really close to the bridge, and the difference of a half step is minuscule and requires a lot of finger pressure, and it puts a lot of strain on the string. You have a very short range of string. It's difficult to produce good tone once you get more than an octave, or much more than an octave, up on the on that one string, which is why you don't just play on one string. You switch from the G string to the D string. Um, once you get, you know, you go G, G sharp, A, A sharp, A, B, C, C sharp, and you do that. Oh, I'm j you do that just by sliding up the string, but then to get to the D, you go back to open string on the next on the next string up there, the D string, and then you do the same thing. Now, you so you could play that D open on this string, or you could play it, you know, it, at your eighth position or whatever whatever you actually call it on violin um, and you would choose which one gives you the better fingering depending on what its neighbors are so um, the thing to know about the stringed instruments is that they are in some ways maybe designed to make to make you not have to think quite as hard about these things the the, the um the thing that's hard for these instruments is finding the pitches, I mean, playing any of those open pitches is really easy. Playing anything after that that requires you to put your fingers down is now a little bit like you have to guess at to where it is. And the half steps then sometimes, especially the higher up you get on the fingerboard, the closer together they are, the harder they are to play in tune. So the key of G has all these nice open strings on it. You can play in the key of G or the key of C or even the key of F and get to use all of those open strings or the key of D. All of those all of those open strings work great, right? On a uh, violin. But if you had to play in the key of instead of in instead of uh, the key of G, try playing in the key of A flat. The key of A flat is only a half step higher, but suddenly none of those open strings are in the key. None of those open strings are in the key. So what that means is that you basically can't use your open. Well, oh no, G is in the key. It's your leading tone. Um, but mo the other low, the, uh, you know. So if you need a low leading tone, hey, you got that one. But the rest of them, you, you're constantly playing above the nut. Above, you know, you're playing having to 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 get that one in tune and it it is harder to get in tune string players will groan very loudly when you ask them to play in flat keys um, especially keys with more than one or two flats you know f's not so bad uh f's not bad at all really um b flat eh, not too bad but you get beyond that and they really you know the key of e flat now suddenly you have two strings that aren't um you know, the key of E flat has three flats in it, the A string and the E string, you don't play open. So, um, yeah, the, the, for the stringed instruments, and the other instruments are tuned a little differently, but it's the same kind of idea. Four strings that are tuned in fifths, the bass strings are tuned in fourths, but same thing, they're tuned to the white keys on the piano, um, and not F. None of them, none of them have Fs. So, uh, they are, and I mentioned that just because F is a white key, but it's a flat key as far as the scale goes, right? So stringed instruments like sharp keys. They're going to prefer sharp keys to flat keys. Beyond that, you, you, the thing to have to know is then writing for violin that if you, violin can play two notes at a time, but it requires you to do it on two different strings. So you have to know, okay, well, this note would be played this position on this string. This note would be played that position on that string. Is that physically doable? There's all sorts of considerations to playing what are called double stops like that. And so again, check out the episode I did a year or two ago on, on strings to get in more into that detail. But I'm talking about more of this, the general ideas here is that uh, when Writing for strings, be aware that sharp keys, they like flat keys, not so much. And it's not just a question of like liking or not liking. It's realistically not going to be as in tune unless the players are really super top notch. Um, I played with some professional string players. And yeah, a piece I wrote in F minor just does did not sound nearly as good. And then I moved it to E minor and suddenly it sounded a whole lot better. But you know, I've had them play in F minor, and they've 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 dealt with it. Oh no, it was B flat minor. That was the one that really, uh, really, I had to change for them to build a sound good at all. 
So, um, yeah, there's all sorts of things to know the, the, about stringed instruments, bowing versus pizzicato, all sorts of things to know. But I'm sort of talking about what the general construction of the instrument means you need to know. The construction of the instrument and what this need, needs to know about how you're going to write for it and what you need to think. So we're talking about creating music, but I'm demonstrating these things using MuseScore. And these are things that you basically need to know um, in order to write for this type of ensemble, basically an orchestral type of thing here. Sometime I'll talk about, you know, the non-common instruments. Um, but anyhow, I hope you all found this session to be useful uh, and that maybe somewhere along the lines you learned something you didn't know. There's all sorts of things that we could still talk about. Um, but uh, this feels like a, a good wrapping up point. So what I'm going to do is flip back to my theme music and uh, play us out and hopefully it actually plays and you hear it and see it so I want to thank everyone for being here again and I'm going to just flip back make sure I'm still live I am still live good um, so I hope you enjoyed this session and whatever issues I might have had at the beginning with sound or, or image picture that people were able to, to work out and things were okay. So this has been the MuseCore Cafe. Next week will be the uh, first uh, um, first week of the month, uh, first Wednesday of the month anyhow. So next week will be an Ask Me Anything session. And, um, oh yeah, B-flat minor Tchaikovsky piano concerto. Yeah, so yeah, I'm not saying you don't write in, in the flat keys at all, but, you know, it's it's harder, is all. So, um, think about questions you might want to ask, and I'll try to answer them. If you need to post a score in order for me to be able to uh, deal with your question, to really understand it, go ahead and post it into the uh, conversation space here in the community. One nice thing about us all being in the community to do this is we all, I know we all have access to build a post there. So uh, tomorrow will be Music Masterclass, and I'll be uh, just looking at some music, talking about different things, accompaniment, looking at some of your scores, and um, just uh, enjoying talking about music. And next week, we'll see if we can start a new kind of challenge, a new kind of uh, theme to be talking about to uh, kind of uh, keep everyone together, kind of a little cohort thing going. We'll make something happen. And I uh, hope you all had a good time, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>